The Teach Yourself series from Via Graphics. Designed to teach you to use your computer the fast and easy way. With the help of this videotape, you can teach yourself Microsoft Word for Windows. I'm Kurt Wartney, along with Leslie Thomas. In this videotape, we will show you the fundamental skills you need to begin using Word for Windows. Word for Windows, or WinWord as it's sometimes called, is one of the most popular word processors for the Windows operating environment. We assume that you have a basic understanding of Windows and how it works. We also assume that you have Word for Windows version 6 installed on your computer's hard drive. So you can reuse the files on the learning disk, we recommend that you copy the files from the diskette to your hard drive. We will perform this process from the DOS prompt. To copy the files from the learning disk, we first place the disk in the appropriate drive. Then we enter xcopy space a colon star dot star space c colon backslash winword backslash intro space slash s. We then press enter. We enter the file directory question with a D for directory and press enter. The files are then read and copied to the correct location. Word for Windows contains four icons in its program group if you perform the complete installation. We'll start learning Word for Windows 6 by looking at these icons. The Microsoft Word icon is the main program icon. Double-clicking on this icon starts the Word for Windows 6 program. The next three icons in our program group are the Word Dialog Editor, the Word Readme Help, and Word Setup. For example, we will go ahead and double-click on the Word Readme Help icon. This opens the contents for a Word for Windows help file. We can close this window by either double-clicking on the upper left-hand control box or by pressing and holding down the Alt key and pressing F4. The dialog editor lets us create our own dialog boxes in Word. We have already used Word Readme Help. The final icon, Word Setup, is used to install additional Word for Windows features or to reinstall parts of the program. We position the mouse pointer over the Microsoft Word icon and double-click. When we do this, we see the greeting screen followed by a tip of the day. We can turn this off so we don't see the tips by clicking on the Show Tips at Startup box at the lower left part of the dialog box. For our purposes, we will turn this off and then click on OK or press Enter to continue. Now we see the main editing screen. We'll start at the top left of our screen. There are two gray boxes, one below the other at the top left. These are the control boxes common to most Windows applications. When we move the mouse pointer over the top box and click once, we see a menu. We can perform the usual window commands here. These affect the Word for Windows program. The escape key clears this menu from the screen. Notice that when we click on the box below the first one, we see the same menu except for some differences. The window control menu works for the current document on the screen, not the entire Word for Windows program. Close uses the control W keystrokes in this menu. Also, we have a next window command that takes us to the next window. The blue bar at the very top of the screen is the title bar. Currently, this reads Microsoft Word Document 1. This is the title of the program and the file we're working on. At the far right, are the windows Minimize, Restore, and Maximize buttons. The down arrow is Minimize. When we click on it, the program is changed to an icon at the bottom of the display. We can double-click to bring this back. The double-headed arrow is the Restore button. 
it restores Word for Windows to its previous size. From this restored window size, we click on the up arrow to maximize or enlarge the window. The white line below the title bar is the menu line. These menus are one way to control Word. To open a menu, we click on it with the mouse pointer. We will click on the file menu. These pull-down menus offer bits of information beyond the commands that are used. Let's take a close look at the file menu to see what it tells us about using Word for Windows pull-down menus. Notice that the part of the menu with new on it is darker, and the text is white instead of black. This means that new is currently highlighted. When we press enter with new highlighted, this command is executed. We are asked for the kind of template we want to use. We press enter for the normal template. We then get a new document to work with. We can tell this by the change in the title bar. It now says document two. To open a menu without the mouse, we hold down the Alt key on the keyboard and then press the underlined letter of the menu we want. In this case, we are doing Alt S for the file menu. To highlight a menu, we can use the arrow keys on the keyboard. When the option we want is highlighted, such as close, we press enter to execute it. In this case, we can tell this worked because we are returned to document one, our original document. It's probably worth your time to move through these menus and investigate the different options available. This is a good way to familiarize yourself with the power of Word for Windows. Besides the pull-down menus, Word for Windows provides you with toolbars for ease of use. The toolbar is just below the menu line on our screen. The buttons are labeled and also have pictures that indicate their function. We can get a more complete description of a button by moving the mouse pointer over it. In this case, we move it over the spell check button. A pop-up box appears with the mouse pointer that tells what the button is. Also, the status bar at the bottom of the window tells us that this button checks the spelling in the active document. To activate a toolbar command, such as open, we simply click on it. Here we see the open file dialog box on the screen. We can press the escape key to remove it. The toolbar we've been using is the standard toolbar. This toolbar contains buttons that perform some of the most common word commands. Below this is the formatting toolbar. This bar contains buttons that represent the most often used text formatting features. Remember to see a description of the button, we move the mouse pointer over it. Once again, we see a description as a mouse pointer and in the status bar, just like we did the other toolbar. Below the formatting toolbar is the ruler bar. This lets us graphically set margins, tabs, and adjust columns. We'll use it later in the tape. You may pause the tape now to practice on your computer. Here's what we learned in this chapter. We discussed the Word program group icons. We learned how to operate in the Word environment. We used control boxes, pull down menus, and the keyboard. We also learned about Word toolbars. We are at a blank Word for Windows editing screen. To begin entering text in this document, we simply press the letter keys on the keyboard. Here is what we'll enter. Entering text is easy using Word for Windows 6.0 and this video training tape. It's fast and fun to learn software with videotapes. Notice that as we near the end of the text line, the letters automatically jump to the next line. This is called word wrap.
We can move within this text by using the arrow keys. The up arrow key moves us up a line. The down arrow key moves down a line. The left arrow key moves us to the left. The right arrow key moves to the right. The blinking bar that moves when we press the arrow keys is called the insertion point. The location of the insertion point determines where text is entered in the document. We will move the insertion point to just in front of the 6 in 6.0. Now we will enter for windows and space. Notice that the text is entered at the insertion point. The words already on the screen move to the right as we enter the new text. This is called the insert mode and is the default. When we look at the bottom right of the screen at the status line and then press the insert key on the keyboard, we see that we change to the overstrike mode. Watch as we press the key multiple times. We'll make sure we're in overstrike mode and then enter the number 7. Notice that the 7 replaces the previous character. We'll press the left arrow key once to move the insertion point before the 7. Now we'll toggle back to insert mode. We'll enter 6. Now the new number is placed at the insertion point and the rest of the text moves over. Many people prefer to leave their word processor in insert mode. We'll remain in insert mode throughout most of this video. We have text on our screen that we don't want. The insertion point is at the 7 on our screen. When we press the delete key on the keyboard, it disappears. The delete key eliminates letters and spaces at the insertion point. If we press the delete key again, this character is removed. Another way to eliminate characters is with the backspace key. We use the backspace key to erase characters to the left. When we press the backspace key here, the letter to the left is erased. Each time we press the backspace key, a letter is removed. We can hold down this key, and it automatically eliminates the letters to the left. You may pause the tape now to practice on your computer. In this chapter, we learned to enter text. We learned how to move around in a document and use overstrike. We also demonstrated the delete and backspace key. An easy way to save is to use the save button. This is the third from the left. It has a picture of a disk on it. We click on this and are then asked to enter a file name. We enter test here and press enter or click on OK. The title bar reflects the new name. We can also save a file using the pull down menu. We click on file or press Alt F to call up the file menu. Here we see save. Notice that it has the shortcut key combination of Control S. We will click on Save to save this document. Notice that this time, we don't get a dialog box on the screen asking us for the file name. The reason for this is that the first time we saved it, the file had no name. After this first time, the document is automatically saved under its current file name. This time, we will use the shortcut key combination, Control-S, to save the file. We hardly notice that anything happened. However, the file is saved. Let's open another file now. We will do this by clicking on the Open File button. It's the second from the left on the standard button bar. When we click on it, we see another dialog box. Here, we can enter the file name of the document we want, or use the mouse to move through the directories and files. In our case, we will go to the directory where we copy the learning disk file to the hard drive. 
We do this by double-clicking on the intro line in the directories box. This brings up a list of files on the learning disk copied to the intro subdirectory at the beginning of the video. We want to open the sample1.doc file, so we double-click on it. Now this document appears on the screen. Notice that we have larger and darker letters in this document. Let's explore the view options next. The standard toolbar currently has a window with 100% on it. This tells us that we are currently in the 100% view. We double click on the number and then enter the number we want. We can change the view zoom to any level from 25 to 200%. You may pause the tape now to practice on your computer. Here's what we've learned in this chapter. We saved a file using the button, menu, and shortcut key combinations. We will open the document change.doc from the intro subdirectory where we copied the learning disk. To begin changing the text, we first select it. We will select the first line using the mouse. When the line is selected, we'll open the format menu. We want the first option, font. When this menu comes up, we can see the many different ways we can alter the text. We can first select the font face. We can click on the item we want with the mouse or scroll through the list with arrow keys. We choose Times New Roman. Next, we can select the font style. We will select bold by clicking on it with the mouse. Notice the sample box near the lower right-hand corner. This provides a representation of how the text will look when we're finished. We can also choose a size for our text. The font size is measured in points. There are 72 points in one inch. We choose 24 points. The next areas affect the text appearance. The appearance area of this menu lets us apply certain looks to our text. This can vary from a simple underline to colors and hidden characters. We will make our text underlined. We can choose from no underline, single, words only, double underline, and dotted underline in this part of the dialog box. Notice the difference between single underline and words only. Single underline places a continuous line under our text sample. Words only places a space between the separate words underlining just the text. Under the effects part of this dialog box, we can choose other text options here. We can make the text strike through, superscript, subscript, hidden, small caps, and all caps. Notice that we can create combinations with these features. We can also change the color of our text. We click on color and see several we can choose from. Remember that the color will not print in color unless you have a color printer. We will return our text color to auto. You may pause the tape now. Besides setting the way the text looks, we can also affect the spacing. This is most easily done in the Fonts dialog box. At the top of this dialog box is a file tab that reads Character Spacing. We click on this and see these options. We can change the spacing. When we choose Expanded, 
condensed, or normal, we see the effects on our text in the example box at the bottom right of the dialog box. We can also set the custom spacing by altering the number here. The default for expanded spacing is 3 points. The default for condensed spacing is 1.75 points. But we can set these to what we want. We can also change the position of the text. We can raise or lower the text in relation to the baseline. The baseline is an imaginary horizontal line directly beneath a line of text. We can set the amount of space the text is above the baseline in the buy box. This dialog box also allows us to set the spacing between characters. This is called kerning. Kerning in Word works only with TrueType or Adobe Type Manager fonts above a minimum size. We turn kerning for fonts on by clicking on it. Now we can set the point size above which Word will automatically adjust the character spacing. This is an advanced feature that you may want to spend more time with. We'll click on OK now to accept the font information. Our selected text is now changed to reflect the new settings. You may pause the tape now. Tabs and indents are fundamental formatting features in most word processors, and Word for Windows is no exception. Tab and indent are words that are sometimes used interchangeably. However, here are the definitions we will use. Tab moves a single line to a preset position in the document. Indent moves all lines of a paragraph to a preset position. Let's begin our look at tabs by seeing how they affect a simple document. We will retrieve the file sample 3 dot dot. Now we'll move the insertion point to the beginning of the first paragraph. Watch what happens as we press the Tab key on the keyboard. The first line is moved in. We will backspace to delete the tab. Now let's use Indent. The single key for Indent in Word is Control-M. We press Control-M and the entire paragraph is scooted over. We will move the insertion point to the beginning of the second paragraph. We will place a hanging indent here. We press Control T and the hanging indent is automatically created. Notice that the bottom triangle and square on the ruler bar move to show the hanging indent. We can adjust the hanging indent by clicking and dragging on the bottom triangle. When we move the insertion point to the beginning of the second paragraph, we see that both triangles move. The top triangle is the first line indent marker. The bottom triangle is the left indent marker. We can also use the toolbar to increase or decrease a tab or indent. Near the right edge of the formatting toolbar are the decrease indent and increase indent buttons. Notice how the text is affected as we click on each of these. Remember, the indent command moves the entire paragraph over. The tab command moves only the first line. If you want to use the menu instead of keys, you'll find the commands in the Format Paragraph dialog box. You may pause the tape now. So far, we have used default tab settings. However, there are times when we need a tab set at a specific location. As with other commands, we can do this in several ways. We will first look at setting tabs with the power bar. We will place the insertion point at the beginning of the third paragraph. Now we move to the tab button at the far left of the ruler bar. This is the button with the L on it. When we click on this, 
we see that it changes to a symbol that looks like an upside down T. This is the center tab. We click again and it turns to the right tab symbol. Another click makes it a center decimal tab. One more click takes us back to the original left tab. To set a tab, we first select the kind of tab we want. Then we click the mouse pointer on the ruler bar where we want the tab set. We have set our normal left tab at the one inch mark. Notice how the text moves over. We will delete this tab setting now by dragging the tab mark off of the ruler bar. Now we place the insertion point at the beginning of the fourth paragraph. We will change the tab to the center tab and this time click on the two inch mark. What happens here is unexpected. Instead of centering the line, it moves to the left. This is because this line of text is too long to see the effect of centering. We will move the insertion point to the end of the first sentence in this paragraph and press the enter key. This makes the line shorter. We now see that the line of text is centered on the tab. We'll drag this tab off the ruler bar now and change to the right align tab. We set this tab at the four inch mark for this example. The right edge of this line of text is now lined up with the tab mark. Once again, we remove the current tab setting and then change to our final tab type, center decimal. We will place it at the three inch mark. When we do, notice that the period at the end of the sentence is lined up with the tab. Let's place a period at the beginning of the word this. When we do this, the text moves to the right, aligning on the new period. This tab setting is especially good for numbers. Like many other features, we can also work with tabs from a dialog box. We click on Format and then Tabs. This brings up the Tabs box. Here we see our current tab setting listed here. Also notice that we have default tab stops set every half inch. Our alignment selection is set at decimal. We will clear all the tabs from this document now by clicking on Clear All. This does not remove the default tab stops. It only affects the tabs we've set. We can now press Enter or click on OK to return to our document and have these changes take effect. In this chapter, we learned to change the font for selected text. We also altered the text appearance. We changed the text spacing and position. We set tabs and indents and learned about the different tab types. Setting line spacing and margins is another important aspect of working with Word for Windows. Line spacing affects the amount of space between lines in a document. Margins affect the spacing from the edges of the printed page to the text. We'll open a new file, file2.doc, from our intro subdirectory for this exercise. To affect the line spacing for an entire document, we first select the document by using the Control-A keystroke combination. Next, we can use one of these three keystroke commands to quickly change the line spacing. Control plus one will make the text single space. Control plus two will double space the lines. Control plus five makes the lines one and a half spaces apart. We will press Control five. This changes the line spacing. Now we'll change it to double spacing by pressing Control 2. Finally, we'll change it back to single spacing by pressing Control 1. With our text still selected, we'll click on the Format menu and then on Paragraph. Near the middle of this dialog box, we see line spacing. It is currently set at single. 
We can click the down arrow here to see our three shortcut key choices. Single, one and a half line, and double. Also, we can set the spacing more precisely if we want. At least set the minimum line spacing for Word and changes to make room for larger text or graphics. Exactly means just what it says. The spacing is exactly how we set it. Multiple line spacing allows us to change the line spacing by any percentage. If we set this line spacing to 1.25, for example, we increase it by 25%. If we set it to 0.75, we decrease it by 25%. We can also click on the up and down arrows in the at box to adjust the spacing. As we move through these numbers, we see that the representation of the line spacing in the preview box changes. We will change our spacing to single and then click on OK or press Enter to return to our document. At the bottom of this document is a list. We want this list to be double spaced. We will select the list using the mouse. Now all we have to do is change the line spacing to 2 by pressing Control 2. The selected text is automatically formatted. Now let's change the margins of our document. We'll open the File menu and then click on Page Setup. We see a Margins tab in this menu. We make sure it is the one in front by clicking on it. Here we can enter the margins for the top, bottom, left, and right of the page. We will enter two inches for each margin. We will enter the number directly and then press the tab key. As we do this, watch how the mock page to the right changes. We press enter or click on OK to make these changes take effect. Our document then changes to reflect the new setting. We can also adjust margins with the ruler bar. First, we'll place the insertion point at the top of the document. Then we need to make sure we're in the Page Layout view. We click on View and then Page Layout. Our current margin settings are reflected by the white area within the ruler. We can drag the gray area to alter the margin settings. We move the mouse pointer until it turns into a horizontal arrow, and then we drag it. When we let go, the text changes to fit the new margin. We can do this on the left and right margin. When we hold down the Alt key while dragging the margin, we see the amount of space to the left of the margin on the page in the gray area. The white center section displays the amount of space here. The gray area on the right indicates the space between the right margin setting and the edge of the paper. We can also adjust the amount of the paragraph indent here. We will first select the entire document by pressing Control A. There are two small triangles at the left margin. The top one adjusts the first line indent. Notice what happens to the first line of each paragraph as we move this top triangle. To affect a paragraph, it either needs to be selected or the insertion point must be in it. The lower triangle at the left margin ruler adjusts the left margin independently of the page margin. Notice that the first line indent mark moves in relation to the setting. On the right, we also have a triangle that performs the same function for the right margin. You can play with these settings until you have your margins set just the way you want them. In this chapter, we learn to change line spacing 
and adjust the page margins. A powerful feature of Word for Windows is its find and replace option. With this command, we can locate the text and then put new text in its place if we want. We still have our file 2.doc document on the screen. We'll change to a normal view for this part of the tape. To begin our search, we'll place our insertion point at the beginning of the word hello. This is where the search will begin. We then select edit, find. Notice that the shortcut key combination for this is control S. In the Find dialog box at the Find What area, we enter Computer. This is the word we're trying to find. We can then press Enter or click on Find Next to find the next occurrence of the word Computer. When the word is located, it is selected in the text. We can press Enter again to locate the word a second time. Notice that we don't find the word Computer, but locate its plural computers. The program looks for the characters that make up the word computer. As long as the letters are in this order, the program will find a match. When we press enter again, we notice that the word computing is skipped. This is because it doesn't match, even though it is close. We can also perform a search and replace for text. We click on replace and then enter the word we want to replace with, PC in our case. We then click on replace. To replace a word at a time, we replace all to replace all the occurrences. We will click on replace all. Word then replaces all the occurrences. It displays an information box that tells us that Word has searched the document and the number of replacements it has made. We click on OK or press Enter to close this dialog box. We will also close the Find box. There are many other options here that we discuss in our Learning Word for Windows advanced videotape. As you become comfortable with Search and Replace, you'll find many reasons to use it. Another useful feature of Word for Windows is the spell checker. Word for Windows will automatically search your document for words it doesn't recognize, and in many cases offers suggested replacements. We've retrieved the learning disk file, file3.doc, for this demonstration. This document has several intentional misspellings. We have the document, file3.doc, on the screen from the intro subdirectory. To spell check the document, we click on the spelling button. The first problem it finds is EXT. The spelling dialog box tells us that EXT is not in the dictionary. We are then given a change to option, followed by a list of other suggestions. We can enter the appropriate text in the change to line by typing the characters we want, TEXT. Then we click on Change, or press Enter to replace the EXT characters with the word text. The next word the program doesn't find is S-M-I-P-L-E. However, we have the correct word located in the Change To line. We click on Change to fix the misspelling. We then see a message that Word has completed the spelling check. We press Enter, or click on OK to clear this information box from the screen. If you make common mistakes in your documents, Word for Windows can fix them before you spell check. This feature is called autocorrect. At the top of this document, we'll enter some more text. Watch what happens in this document when we enter TEH and press the space bar. The word is automatically corrected. Now we'll continue to enter some more text. The file will INCL, examples, ADN, other items. 
you can see that autocorrect automatically fixes certain things, such as the mistyping of the, along with and. These are both common typographical errors. One way to add a word to the autocorrect list is to click on Tools and then Autocorrect. In the Replace area, we enter the text we want to replace. This can be a common typographical error or text we want expanded from a shorthand kind of entry. We'll enter P-E-L for Replace. And then we press the Tab key. In the With area, we enter the word we want to replace the with characters for. In this case, this will be telephone. We then click on add or press enter. This places the new autocorrect entry in the list. We click on OK or press enter to close the autocorrect box. Now, we'll test our new entry. We type PEL and press the space bar. The word telephone appears. That's how simple it is to enter autocorrect text. We'll close this document now and not save it by pressing Control F4 and answering the prompt N for no. We want to open the file pages.doc from the intro subdirectory. This is a longer document that is three pages long. To add page numbers to the document, we click on Insert and then on Page Numbers. This displays the Page Numbers dialog box. Here, we can set the position of the page number. Currently, this is listed as the top of page header. We click on the arrow to the right to see our other choice, bottom of page footer. Notice how the preview changes as we choose one option or the other. We will leave this set at top of page. The alignment drop-down box below this shows five choices, left, center, right, inside, and outside. Once again, the preview changes as we move through our choices. Notice that inside puts the page number on the inside of two facing pages. Outside places the page numbers on the outside of two facing pages. We will select left for our document. Another option that is useful is Show Number on First Page. When this box is checked, we will see the page number on the first page. When it is not checked, the page number will not appear on the first page. We will leave it checked. To set the format for our page numbers, we click on the Format button. Currently, we are at the Number Format. Clicking on the arrow here shows the other options we have. We will stay with the standard 1, 2, 3 number system. We will not concern ourselves with chapter and other options in this dialog box, so we click on OK and then on OK again. Now, in the page layout view, we see a faint number 1 located in the upper left-hand corner of our document. We can move through this document and see our other page numbers. When we press Control N to move to the end of our document, we see that the text on the last page doesn't fill the entire page. We want to center all the printed text here. To do this, we click on File and then Page Setup. We then click on the Layout tab. Vertical alignment is the item we want. We click on it and then click on Center. We want to apply this change to the entire document, so the Apply To area is set the way we want it. We click on OK and the current page is adjusted so the text is centered on the page. In this chapter, we learn to use Find and Replace. After this, we learned how to check our document for spelling errors. 
we also discovered the basics of autocorrect. Finally, we added page numbers to a document. In many cases, you will want to print out your document so you can send it. Word for Windows makes printing easy. We can print our document with the click of a button, a couple of keystrokes, or from a pull-down menu. One way to print a document is to click on the printer button in the standard toolbar. This is the fourth one from the left. When we do this, we see a small printer show up on the status bar. This tracks the printer's progress for us. Notice that when we print using the button, we don't get a dialog box of any kind. Word automatically takes care of the printer details for us. We can also print by clicking on File and then Print. When we do this, we get a Print dialog box. This lets us make further decisions about the way we want the document printed. In most cases, the standard type of information here is what we need to print a document. This is the case for us, so we simply press Enter or click on OK to begin the printing. Another way to print is to use the control P keystroke combination. We press these keys and see the same print dialog box we had before. Once again, in most cases we press enter to begin the printing. It's sometimes hard to remember a particular feature or keystroke in a program as complex as Word for Windows. Fortunately, the program comes with several help functions that make it easier to use the software. The first help item we'll look at is the F1 key. Pressing this single key puts the powerful feature at your fingertips. We press the F1 key and see this window. This is the Word Help Contents window. To learn how to actually use Help, we press F1. This is Help on Help. To choose a topic, we click on the underlined topic we want to see. In this case, we click on Topic. This brings up a definition box on the word topic. Dashed underlines are definitions. Full underlines are actual help subjects or topics. We press the escape key to clear this definition box. When we click on help basics, a help screen on help basics appears. Notice that there are more definition words here, including maximize and minimize. When we click on either of these, we see the definition for the word. Once again, we press the escape key to clear this box from the screen. If we want to see where we've been in help, we click on history. This is a trail of our walk through help. We can click on back to move us back along this trail one step at a time. To search for a particular topic, we click on the search button. Here, we can enter the subject we're looking for. In this case, printing. When we find our topic, we press enter or click on show topics. The actual topic or topics are then listed in the bottom window. We click on go to or press enter to see the health information for the subject. To close the window, we double-click on its control box. Another way of finding help is to click on the Help button at the far right of the standard toolbar. This turns the normal mouse pointer into a help pointer. We can click on an object to get help on it. We will point at the horizontal ruler and then click. This brings up the help window on the horizontal ruler. We can also close this help window by using the Alt-F4 combination. The help menu is another way to access help. We click on help and see our options here. Content, search for help on, index, quick preview, examples and demos, tip of the day, word perfect help, technical support, and about Microsoft Word. We will use one of these items, tip of the day. We click on it 
and see the same type of dialog box we normally see when we start the program. We can close this box by clicking on OK or pressing Enter. You can experiment with the different help functions to help learn more about Word and its features. If your writing is like ours, you frequently produce the same or similar correspondence day in and day out. Word for Windows has a full set of templates that cover the basics of business and professional writing. Before we use this option, let's define what templates are and how they work. Templates are a special kind of document that provide the fundamental features for creating a final document. These features can include text, formatting, styles, macros, auto text entries, menus, and toolbars. To use a template, we click on File and then New. The New File dialog box shows a list of templates we can use. We will double click on the Memo 1 template. This template then opens as a new document. We can use our editing techniques we've learned in this video to replace the areas that we need to customize. For example, we select Name next to 2. Then we enter the text we want. It's just like editing any other document. We select and then change. Now we'll open another new document by clicking on File and then New. Notice that some of the templates in the list have the word Wizard next to them. Wizards are templates that ask questions to help format them. This is a quick way to produce good-looking work. We will double-click on the Calendar Wizard. The first question asks us which direction we want to print the calendar. We choose the orientation we want by clicking on either Portrait or Landscape. The box to the left shows us what the document will look like. When we're ready to move on, we click the Next button near the bottom right of the box. The next question here asks us for information on the styles we want. We choose Banner and then click on Next. Now we're prompted for a picture. We want one, so we click on Yes and then Next. Now we set the date the calendar begins and ends. We will accept these suggestions by pressing Next. This screen with the flag on it is the final screen. We ask for help as the wizard works, or just display the final result. We are only interested in the final project, so we click on Finish. Word now goes to work creating our calendar. When the program is finished, we see the calendar on the screen. Notice that it closely resembles the samples that we saw as we selected the options we wanted. Now we can change or print out our calendar, just like any other Word for Windows document. In this chapter, we learned three ways to print a document. Then we saw how to get help on a topic. We also learned about templates and wizards. This is simply an overview of templates and wizards in Word for Windows. For more information on using and creating templates, refer to the tutorial Learning Word for Windows 6.0 Advanced. We'll also learn to make outlines, merge files, and manage documents in the advanced video. That concludes this video tutorial. We at Via Graphics would like to thank you for choosing our company for your computer training needs. Remember, if you plan to learn Word for Windows or any other computer software, there is no better way than through video training with Via Graphics.